The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. The remaining electronic vote will be conducted as a five-minute vote. The unfinished business is the vote on adoption of the House Resolution 167 on which the yeas and nays were ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Calendar Number 17, House Resolution 167, resolution providing for consideration of the joint resolution, House Joint Resolution 48, making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2011 and for other purposes. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Members will record their votes by our electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. And the House is back and voting. A couple of them here. First one's 15-minute vote, and this is on the, the rule for the debate on the short-term spending bill, the continuing resolution. It's a 15-minute vote. The second one will be a five-minute vote on the, uh, the journal, again, the official written record of the previous day's activities. But the main business of the day is the short-term spending measure. Speaker Boehner said earlier today that he's confident the CR is going to pass. The Hill reports today that Democrats are losing patience with the short-term spending measure. We get some, uh, some details on what's in this short-term spending bill. We spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter just a short while ago. Nancy Ignanovich of BNA News, could this be the last short-term spending bill? I really think it could be, because there is growing unrest among some House Republicans for a series of stopgap bills, even though in a lot of ways they're getting what they want, they're getting more cuts as they go, but I think some fear that they're losing the momentum for the big budget cutting bill that they want and they want to draw a line in the sand and, and get the thing over with. Well, what else is underlying some of that unrest that members have? They're not getting the policy riders on these short-term bills that they had in H.R. 1, which they passed before the last recess with a good strong vote and maybe they feel they're losing momentum for that. The short-term bills don't have the policy riders that they want for, among other things, to defund President Obama's health care reform bill. Well, let's talk about the, the longer term bill. The uh, negotiations continue behind the scenes. Any idea how those are going? Actually, we haven't heard much about the negotiations on the long term bill. After last week, when we didn't hear about any talks, we thought that they'd be starting up again this week because Vice President Biden, who the President uh, detailed to um, oversee those talks has returned from an overseas trip uh, but we haven't heard about the principals getting together again and in the meantime having to work to get the votes to pass the short-term bills seems to take some energy away so that maybe leaders don't have as much time to work on the longer term bill to fund the government through uh, September 30th what about the uh, congressional Democrats? Where do they stand on approving another CR, this one cutting another $2 billion per week? Well, essentially, they are on board, <clears throat> and one of the reasons why is because the cuts that are in the current CR were cuts that the president himself proposed in his budget. And last week before this um, bill was um, unveiled by House Appropriations Committee Chairman Hal Rogers, um, it had been negotiated with Democrats, including Senate Democrats, and they're on board. So I don't think the opposition is coming from Democrats so much as from some Republicans. Well, assuming the House passes the bill today, what's the, the, the prospect in the Senate? Um, some Republicans in the Senate have said they won't vote for it, including um, freshman Senator Rubio and now today Senator Jim DeMint. But the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, said yesterday that he's confident this will pass, and he says it should pass. It has his support. Um, it will buy time to get the longer-term bill done, and in the process it also includes cuts that House Republicans favor and Senate Republicans also. So even though he said it might be a difficult week and not everyone is happy, he said by week's end he believes it will pass. Well, well on the Senate side, will Senator McCain get his amendment approved that would uh, propose providing full year funding for the Defense Department? I think it's unlikely. It would really change the dynamics of everything because basically it would uh, fund the Pentagon 
for the rest of the year and provide all the funding needed for the wars overseas. And that's right there, you know, over $500 billion. And that's a large part of the negotiation on the bill to fund the government through next fall. And if you take defense funding off the table, then it's harder to cut defense as part of this negotiation. Nancy Ignanovich of BNA News with an update on 2011 federal spending. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. An initial debate has begun. This is a vote on the rule for that short-term spending bill. It's a 15-minute vote. One more five-minute vote will follow. If the rule passes, it allows for an hour of general debate with no amendments. Well, a lot of questions about spending came up today. Quick news conference with uh, Democratic House leadership. You'll hear from Leader Sp uh, Nancy Pelosi and others. We're going to show you some of that news conference as this vote continues. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much and good morning. We continue to focus on the creation of jobs uh, in this country. Uh, the President uh, said it best during his State of the Union message that we simply have to out-innovate, we have to out-educate, and we have to grow this economy. Democrats are prepared and have stepped up to do that. We recognize in these difficult times that cuts have to be made, and we've stepped forward to that as well, putting everything on the table, but drawing a line when it comes to important programs that we face and continuing our focus on jobs. It's been 11 weeks, and the Republicans have focused on nothing but a social agenda. The American people are crying out for jobs, asking us to deal with this deficit. Democrats continue to step up to the plate and offer our handout to our Republican colleagues to come and join us and participate in this. With that, let me turn it over to Javier Becerra, our Vice Chair. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, didn't we just see each other a couple weeks ago here? Same time, same location, same situation. Uh, deja vu all over again. Here we go, two-week, three-week budgeting. That is no way to run the largest economy in the world or the smallest business on Main Street. But here we are, sputtering two to three weeks at a time. This Republican roadmap towards budgeting is ultimately going to edge us towards a government shutdown if the Republicans continue this way. Baby step budgeting has never worked for the United States, and it's not going to work this year. We need to have a course that America knows it can follow. The last thing we need is to have further instability. We've seen what happens when you have instability in places like the Middle East. We've seen what happens when government is temporarily out of service, as in Japan. And we see what happens when we have chaos reigning in America when it comes to budgeting. The American people don't like it, and the American people want us to get to work. We should be about hiring. Americans, not firing Americans. And this Republican budget essentially takes 700,000 Americans off the payroll. Three weeks, that's 75,000 jobs that are in jeopardy as a result of this Republican three week budget. And so it's time to get back to work and do the business of America, of putting Americans back to work. That's what Democrats have been all about. We started two years ago with President uh, Obama talking about creating jobs. We hope at some point after 71 days, Republicans now in the majority in the House will talk about creating jobs, not losing jobs. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Democratic leader, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much, U.S. Chairman Becerra. Thank you, Chairman Larson, for bringing us together this morning. Uh, before I uh, uh, join my colleagues in associating myself with their remarks and expanding on them, I want to uh, once again express the sadness and the sympathy that we have for the people of Japan. We're watching closely to see how we can be helpful in a humanitarian way, and the administration has sent help in that regard, also in the technical way as far as Daiichi, uh, the, uh, the nuclear plant there. Uh, it's very, very beyond biblical proportions, the loss of life, uh, the change in the economy and the society uh, there. Uh, we wish them strength. Uh, we want to help them as friends. And again, our sympathy and our support go out to the people of Japan. 
My colleagues have said that when the president became president, we started creating jobs right away. It is so. President Obama has been a job creator from day one. Recognizing the recession, near depression, that our country was in uh, at the end of the Bush administration, in his, state of the, in his inaugural address, the president called for swift, bold action now. One week and one day after the president's inaugural address, the House of Representatives passed the Recovery Act, a Recovery Act which created or saved three and a half million jobs. Not enough. We need more, but we are going in a very strong new direction. By contrast, here we are, what is it, 11, seven weeks, 11 weeks, whatever, ele we're in the 11th week of this new term in Congress, and we haven't seen one sign of job creation. In fact, we're going in the opposite direction. Whether you're talking about one economist or another, and whatever their measure it is, it's always what the direction the Republicans are taking us in now will harm our economic recovery, will create not create jobs, but we'll lose jobs. And the speaker says, hundreds of thousands of jobs, so be it. So be it? No, I don't think so. What we must have is job creation, actually the only job creation that has been on the floor of the House in this 11-week uh, period has been our democratic initiatives. Build America bonds to build the infrastructure of America in a strong way, make it in America, and uh, other legislation to, uh, to uh, stop jobs going overseas uh, by reversing uh, the tax breaks for companies taking jobs overseas. So those are the only initiatives, and the Republicans overwhelmingly voted against those initiatives. So all we've seen in job creation has come from the Democrats. What we've seen from the Republicans is taking us in the wrong direction. We have made it clear that we will extend a hand of friendship, as Congressman Morrison said. Uh, but, but we will judge every initiative that comes to the fore by three criteria. One, does it create jobs? Two, does it strengthen the middle class? Three, uh, does it reduce the deficit? All of them on a par with each other, all of one piece. What we see with the uh, reversing the economic recovery in the bill is not an initiative uh, that will reduce the deficit. Instead, we see false economies that must be stopped. Now, we have proposed, we saved $41 billion at the end of last year, $41 billion cut in President Obama's budget. Only one Republican voted for that. So far, the Democrats have cut $41 billion uh, from the budget with only one Republican vote, and the Republicans have passed $4 billion with a bipartisan vote. 10 to 1 difference. I, I hope you will take note of that because most of the deficit reduction by 10 to 1 has come from, from the Democrats. So again, create jobs, reduce the deficit, strengthen the middle class, we're there with them. We haven't seen any evidence of that so far. I'm very pleased that we're joined this morning by two of our new members, fresh from the trenches of campaigns and uh, from different sides of the country, uh, but very strongly committed to the middle class. Uh, first, you'll hear from David Cicilline, a new member from Rhode Island. David, thank you. Thank you, Madam Leader. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here with uh, the leadership of the Democratic Caucus. Uh, as the leader just said, I'm a new member of Congress. Uh, I came here really because uh, Rhode Islanders sent me here to do everything I can to get people back to work. And I fully expected that even though uh, we lost uh, control of the House, that that would be our agenda, that the Republicans would take up a jobs plan and jobs agenda. And we might debate about the fine points of it, but we would all be working together to get Americans back to work, to get Rhode Islanders back to work. I've been here 11 weeks. Um, there hasn't been a single jobs bill proposed by the Republican leadership in the House. We haven't had a committee hearing on a jobs bill. Uh, we haven't been able to really engage the Republicans in the urgent work of getting Americans back to work. Instead, they focused on reducing investments in things that are ne necessary to rebuild our country and to rebuild the economy of America. You know, cutting Pell Grants and Head Start and uh, attacking women's health and prevention health services and um, reducing investments in infrastructure. All the things the President outlined that we need to do to rebuild our economy and to get people back to work. Out-innovate, 
I'd educate, I'd invest in infrastructure. That's not happening. And so I'm here to join my colleagues to say our number one priority has to be to get Americans back to work, to focus on job creation. I've been here 11 weeks. Our Republic, the Republican leadership has not done that. This is really a call to action. Either set out a jobs agenda, a jobs plan, or uh, work with the Democratic leadership to develop a jobs agenda, but, but focus on what is most urgent to all Americans, and that is getting people back to work. Thank you. Thank you, David. David, uh, thank you for your leadership as, a, uh, I say, former mayor of Providence. Uh, up until he became a congressperson, the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, he knows up close and personal uh, the pain that the American people are feeling, and he's come here to fight for them. Thank you, David Cicilline, Congressman. And from the other side of America, a woman who, a, who, a, a member of Congress who served in the state legislature there, so she came to the House effective from the start, a leader in the, in the legislature in Hawaii, and now a leader from the start in the Congress of the United States, Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa. Thank you, Leader, and thank you for your kind words for the people of Japan. Like David, I'm new. I tell people from California, like the Leader, that we make California the Midwest. Hawaii, of course. <laughs> So anybody complains about air travel, come see me. <laughs> now, when, when, when we looked upon what happened, the devastation that has hit Japan and, and its impact, in Hawaii, we have already felt it. Our projections and our revenues have gone down for the first time as a result of it, and we know what that's all attributed to. We do know that when we were voted in, particularly David and I, the new ones, people wanted us to come here and address the economy, and in specifically jobs. Because jobs is what makes each and every one of us feel good. Jobs is what makes us have public confidence. Jobs is what tells us we're on the right track. And we haven't seen one. Eleven weeks have gone by. We haven't seen a job bill yet. But what's worse than that is we have seen cuts. And I'm hoping that the people do not accept just the mantra that if you cut, somehow that equates to saving the economy. It's not the same. Look at what we've experienced in Hawaii, for example. There's a cut. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center has been cut. What does that mean? Look at all of you who are watching the news reports and how many of you relied on those reports. It's a cut. Those are jobs. Those are essential jobs, not only for us in the state, but throughout the Pacific region. That is not how we build public confidence. That is not how we tell people we're on the right track. It isn't just cuts. We believe in cutting the deficit. That's part of, like the leader said, that's part of the agenda. That's equal with the creation of jobs. But there's a right way to do it. And we're here to say to our Republican colleagues, let's do it together. Let's do it the right way. We can get it done if we all pull together. But instead, to simply say cut, 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 it's not going to create jobs, jobs, jobs. And more importantly than that, it's not going to make the people feel good about where we're headed. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> we'll take a couple. Yes. Mr. Hoyer said last week that this was the last temporary measure that he's going to vote for. I was wondering if that's kind of the, the sentiment in the caucus, that after this one will be more uh, united in opposition to another short-term uh, fix. And if, if in your discussions also with the White House and the Senate, that's their feeling. I certainly think that that's the growing sentiment in the caucus. Many of us didn't even vote for the first one. <laughs> do, you, do you think that um, most of your caucus will vote for this one tonight? I don't believe they will. I, I don't. Uh, it, we aren't whipping this. People are just voting uh, as they as they want to uh, convey what this is. That we support cuts. Yes. Uh, that this is, as the gentleman said, as far as we're willing to go. But for some of us, we don't even want to go that far. But this, the, how the Democrats vote on this is not what we should be watching. Where we go from here is what is going to be important. Many feel that this is a ruse, that this is uh, just a matter of death by a thousand slashes. And somehow, uh, as we said, uh, as Javier pointed out two weeks ago, what the American people are looking for uh, is, is uh, the idea of certainty. And what we've created here is this aura of uncertainty. And with the constant cloud hanging out there in the future that they continue to project, uh, that they will uh, shut down uh, the government. 
And so this is of uh, grave concern to the American people and certainly to members of our caucus. Uh, we, we heard last week from military leaders about the kind of instability that this budget approach is causing. Uh, we hear it from our constituents, the anxiety that's accompanied with this every two weeks. So this is really, I think, an important issue to raise. You know, we need resolution of this in a comprehensive way. We need a budget resolution. This every two weeks is, is really destabilizing for the government, causing incredible anxiety with military leadership, civilian leadership, contractors. It's just not a way to run a government. I think the most important part of it is, and I sit on armed services, so what you do recognize is that when you start to tweak one part and it's done in this very almost just let's find blocks of money and let's cut it, then you don't know what the consequence is. Right now we do know for the Pacific in particular the role that the military needs to play in the attempts to help stabilize and help rebuild is going to be critical, very critical. But they will each begin their testimony before armed services with the statement that the CR is the worst thing for them. It just does not give them a sense of security. They don't know how to plan. You have people who are saying, well, the, if the cuts come through, it means they're going to just have to shut down. One of the things, for example, talk about economic growth and creation of jobs. Hawaii will host APEC in November of this year. East West Center is the lead agency to do that. East West Center is cut in the first CR to 10 million. Now, if it goes through like that, what's going to happen? And they cut it to zero, by the way, but that did not go through. If it continues, guess what? They shut down. What happens to APEC in this very critical time, especially when we're looking at what is it that our, our great partner, Japan, is now going to do? What will happen? That's probably something that they can look forward to to help build. These are the kinds of cuts that are going through. And that's not the way for us to, to act here. The Republicans are still complaining that your colleagues on the Senate side are not reaching out to them. The Vice President went abroad after that first meeting. Is the White House doing enough to make sure we get past these short term Yes, I'm very satisfied with the leadership of the White House on this. Uh, we had the meeting, the leadership in the House and Senate, bipartisan, uh, in a bipartisan way with uh, the Vice President. Uh, we had a course of action that came out of there. It was positive that more needs to be done. We'll continue our work together, and that's what we will do. But let me say as we go uh, into this, de continue in this debate, we're talking about cutting here and cutting there and what the impact of it is. We're talking about trying to find middle ground. I think that that may not be enough. If middle ground is to say that six million seniors who are homebound will no longer receive uh, uh, meals on wheels, but we can just compromise at three million. I don't think that that's an appropriate debate. I think the debate is on a higher ground, not just middle ground, but on a higher ground of our values. It's not just about the dollars. It's about the values. And again, we can cut, the, we can cut uh, uh, in a way that does not undermine our values. It's not about, again, about money. It's about the morality of what we are doing. And this debate in the public about who we are as a country, how we keep the American people safe, how we continue economic growth and the creation of jobs, how we educate our children, how we protect people in their neighborhoods, how do we keep our country strong and measuring it in the health and well-being of the American people. Have all members that's where voted? the debate has to be, Have not in misrepresentations voted? about this cut or that Does cut. Does any member wish to change it. their vote? The GAO oh, gave us a roadmap to cut Mr. waste, Kilby, fraud, and abuse, Meeks, and we're all Mr. for Gutierrez, doing that. Mr. Larson, we thank them for the timeliness of their report. The Fiscal Commission gave us a, a direction on how to reduce the deficit, but cautioned that you can't make these cuts right away early in domestic re investments uh, because you will... On this the yeas are 241, the nays are 181. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business of the, is the question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it.
and the journal stands approved. The House will be in order. Members should be aware they don't have any more votes for a while. Take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. Members will take their conversations off the floor or take their seats. Members will vacate the well. Members at the rear of the chamber by the railings will also please come to order. Again, the body, the body will be in order. For what purpose does the uh, gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the rule, I call up the joint resolution H.J. Res. 48, making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2011 and for other purposes, and ask for its immediate consideration. Clerk will report the title of the joint resolution. House Joint Resolution 48, Joint Resolution Making Further Continuing Appropriations for Fiscal Year 2011 and for Other Purposes. Pursuant to House Resolution 167, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers, gentleman from Washington, Mr. Dix, each will control 30 minutes. Not yet. The House will still be in order. Once again, if you have conversations, please take them off the floor or take your seats. Those in the rear of the chamber, if you take your conversations off the floor, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and Without include extraneous order. material on H.J. Res. 48 and that I may include tabular material on the same. Still so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. I rise today to support H.J. Res. 48, the fiscal year 2011 further continuing appropriations resolution. This temporary CR will allow us to avoid 
a government shutdown that could otherwise occur on March 18th while cutting spending by $6 billion to control our nation's staggering deficits and to facilitate the continued recovery of our nation's economy. We've made it clear Chair is finding it difficult to hear with conversations that are still going on in the back of the chamber on all sides. <coughs> Gentleman from Kentucky deserves to be heard. Gentleman may continue. We've made it clear that a government shutdown is not an option, period. We will not allow this to happen on our watch. This bill funds the government for an additional three weeks until April 8, maintaining the critical support the government provides uh, to the American people and allowing for the necessary time to complete negotiations on a final long-term agreement for the remainder of this year. While funding the essential government agencies and programs, this CR makes $6 billion in spending cuts, trimming $2 billion for every week to continue our efforts to rein in spending and putting a dent in our massive and unsustainable deficit. Together with the $4 billion that we cut two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, along with the $6 billion we cut in this bill, we will have cut $10 billion from current year spending. That makes it the largest recession in American history. And so it is working. H.J. Res 48 reduces or terminates a total of 25 programs for a savings of $3.5 billion. These cuts include funding rescissions, reductions, and program terminations. It also eliminates earmark accounts within agriculture, commerce, justice, science, financial services, general government, interior subcommittee jurisdictions, saving the American taxpayers $2.6 billion in earmark spending, which the President and both houses of Congress have agreed they do not support. These cuts are the tough but necessary legwork required to help balance our budgets and halt the dangerous downward spiral of skyrocketing deficits. While a short-term funding measure such as this is not the preferable way to fund the government, at this point, it's vital. The budget for fiscal 2011, which was putted to us by the previous Congress, is long, long overdue. I agree with many of my colleagues that we must get down to business and come to a final agreement as quickly as possible. Our economy must not be threatened by perpetual government shutdowns, which create uncertainty and a loss of confidence for job creators across the country. This continuing resolution provides us with an appropriate length of time for negotiations makes good on our promise to the American people to cut spending, provide certainty and stability, and allows essential federal programs to continue while these negotiations continue, uh, ensue. I'm hopeful, Mr. Speaker, that this continuing resolution can be passed swiftly so we can turn our attention to the realities of our debt and deficit crisis and begin to put the nation on the right path for the next fiscal year, 012. Our constituents have asked us to whip our spending into shape, to provide solutions that help our economy grow and to help our citizens get jobs. This CR addresses their expectations responsibly over the short term and is just one of the set of bills that we intend to produce over the next year that will continue to put the nation's budget back into balance and help our economy continue on the road to recovery. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Washington. I uh, yield my style.
time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today the House is considering the fifth continuing resolution for FY11 to keep the federal government running. Here we are in the middle of March, considering yet another short-term bill that is supposed to buy us time to negotiate funding for the remainder of the fiscal year, and I hope that proves to be true. We need to bring this to a conclusion. The extension reduces spending in FY11 by $45 billion below the President's request. It adds another $6 billion in common ground spending reductions. In total, the measure cuts $51 billion below the President's request. The idea behind the three-week extension is to provide an opportunity for the House, Senate, and White House to settle all outstanding issues on fiscal year 2011 appropriations. I remain hopeful the negotiations will succeed and we will be able to give our agencies some amount of certainty for what little remains of fiscal year 2011. Today in the New York Times there was a long article showing what kind of disruption occurs in federal agencies including Defense and Social Security and others, uh, Head Start for example, because we haven't uh, gotten the, these bills enacted. But I, I must remind my colleagues that if the CR extended for the remainder of the year, we would be cutting spending at historic $51 billion below the President's request. I am wary that cutting deeper will threaten a fragile economic recovery. Most economists see cuts in H.R. 1 as a drag on the economic growth, leading to the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs. As Federal Chairman Bernanke projects, uh, Moody's Mark Zandi estimates 400,000 jobs lost for the remainder of this year and 700,000 more next year if H.R. 1 is enacted. Goldman Sachs think it would be as high as 2.4 million jobs lost. In yesterday's ABC News Washington Post, the American people poll, the American people believe that the Republican proposal cuts uh, in, H, uh, in H.R. 61 fit, will, cut the, will hurt the economic recovery. I am relieved that uh, Chairman Rogers crafted a bill that relies on previously identified reductions, a significant portion of which were old earmarks. And while I know my colleagues will not agree with and may not be able to support some of the specific program cuts included in this package, I appreciate, appreciate that there was a genuine attempt to engage the Senate and White House before they were chosen. Most importantly, I'm tremendously relieved that Chairman has stayed away from the controversial writers in this stopgap measure. He knows, as I do, that these writers would almost guarantee a veto by the administration, which would almost guarantee a government shutdown. An appropriation bill is not the place to decide enormously complex and controversial policy issues. I'm uh, not pleased to be here today with yet another short-term bill. I sincerely hope that we will use this three-week period of time judiciously so the next time we consider a bill for fiscal year 2011, it will be the last and for the remaining, months of the remaining six months of this year. And I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Florida, a new member of our committee, Mr. diaz Balart, three minutes. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, there's a couple things that are really not debatable. I think the American people understand, and I think everybody understands, that, that we are on, un, on an unsustainable path. We are on an unsustainable ta uh, path as far as unemployment. The number, unemployment numbers are still frighteningly high. Uh, we are on an unsustainable path as far as borrowing and as far as, as, far as uh, spending. So frankly, we have a couple options here. We can continue that unsustainable path, which is borrowing more and spending more, or we could change the way we're doing and try to get our fiscal act and our fiscal house in order. I commend the chairman, Chairman Rogers, for bringing forward a CR, an extension, that does just that, that brings some sanity to this process, that reduces the size, the scope, and the amount of spending that does so responsibly after reviewing programs and reviewing funding and reviewing what the federal government is doing. And that's exactly what we have in front of us today. Yes, we wish that we could have not just a, an extension, but we could go through the entire year. The reason, by the way, that we're even talking about this right now is because the Democrats failed to pass it 
So now we are forced to do so. But we already passed a CR for the remaining part of the year, but unfortunately the Senate has not been able or has not been willing to do their part. So we are forced once again to do an extension. This is a real extension that reduces cost, that reduces expenses, that does so responsibly and takes us off this unsustainable path. This does so by borrowing less, by spending less, and yes, it will have the effect, Mr. Speaker, of getting our fiscal house in order and once again allow this country to start creating jobs in a real way, not just piecemeal way. So I urge our colleagues to support this responsible CR. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield two minutes to the distinguished lady from California, Barbara Lee, a member of the Appropriations Committee. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much. I want to thank the gentleman uh, for yielding uh, and just say today that uh, once again I rise to oppose uh, this continuing resolution. Once again, the majority uh, is reading from a very familiar script uh, that imposes budgetary pain on vulnerable communities that can least endure these budget cuts. For a third consecutive time now, the majority is presenting a temporary spending bill totaling $6 billion in spending cuts and $2.6 billion in earmark cuts to very meaningful programs. And once again, this CR does nothing to promote jobs. The majority pledged to develop jobs when they regain control of the House, but they continue to renege on their promise. It's important to emphasize that the proposed cuts will hit communities that can least afford these hits. The loss of $185 million in state and local law enforcement assistance provided by burn grants will further squeeze tight but police budget. With these cuts, communities will be struggling to find funding to support vital police functions. At the same time, when drug use and drug trafficking is on the rise, this CR includes cuts to cops to combat the spread of meth use and distribution. Rather than continue to fund vital programs at the community level that work, we are witnessing budgeting through biweekly CRs. And these cuts will further harm highly vulnerable communities that, only, that greatly rely on COPS policing services and technology grants. Now also, my constituents regularly call my office asking what source of funding is going to replace uh, earmarks that historically have supported jobs, small businesses, schools, nonprofits. Also, I continue to uh, press the administration witnesses on budget in budget justification hearings regarding the impact of the elimination of earmarks and what alternative resources will replace them. Thank you. I hope we vote no on the CR. Gentleman from Kentucky. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the chairman of the Transportation HUD Subcommittee on Appropriations. Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Latham. Gentleman from Iowa is recognized for two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Two, two minutes. I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the chairman for uh, yielding time. Uh, I do rise in support of this joint resolution. Uh, it's not because I want to, uh, but because it's necessary uh, to support it today. It's necessary because we're stuck in a situation that re results from the previous majority's lack of of uh, completing its work last year. And I think we need to step back and just look at the situation that we were handed this year. Uh, for the first time since the Budget Act of 1974, Mr. Speaker, uh, the House failed to pass a budget last year. The House also failed, except for two occasions, to pass appropriation bills. The Senate did nothing. So what we are left with today is this mess that we're in with no uh, fiscal year 2011 budget, uh, no appropriation bills uh, passed last year, nothing done. So we're given this mess today to clean up, and what we need is a little more time. But in the meantime, we are going to cut spending, $6 billion of cuts, $2 billion a week for the three weeks that this bill will be in place. Uh, it's not enough. We've got to look at the 
overall problem that we have in this country, $14.3 trillion of debt, an annual one-year deficit of $1.65 trillion. Now, while this just scratches the surface, we've got to address long-term the spending here in Washington, D.C. We've got to look at not just the discretionary side, which this bill does, but look at all the entitlements. We're only addressing about 15 percent of the whole budget in this bill. Uh, we've got to make sure that we look at all the other 85 percent, which is mandatory, which are uh, other spending that are out there that cause uh, this explosion of debt that we have. What this is is a, a very good first step of going forward to really get a handle on the spending. And also, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that the White House finally get involved and show some leadership as far as trying to get our fiscal house in order. And I yield back. Gentleman from Washington. I yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran, who is the ranking member on the Interior and Related Agencies Appropriations and EPA, and uh, also a former chairman of that committee. Mr. Moran. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for three minutes. I thank the uh, very distinguished uh, member from Washington and thank him for uh, his leadership. But he knows as well as do I trust all of the members that this is no way to run a government lurching back and forth like a drunken sailor, the agencies not knowing when or whether they're going to get their money. Actually, I should take that back because the Navy would never conduct operations like this. And the distinguished chairman from Kentucky well knows that this is not the way we want to be doing business. But yet, here we are with another CR. We just had a hearing this week with the Forest Service. As the members know, they hire hundreds, sometimes thousands of temporary seasonal workers to fight fires in our nation's forests. They can't do that. They don't know how much money they're going to have. And the folks that they would hire seasonally as a result can't take those jobs, don't know what they're going to do. It disrupts people's lives, hundreds of thousands of people's lives directly, millions of people's lives indirectly. As I say, this is no way to run a government. But why are we doing it? Because we can't agree on H.R. 1, and we shouldn't agree on H.R. 1 as passed by the House. So many riders that should have gone through legislative committees that did, in fact, when they were put in the bill after careful consideration and we gave them 10 minutes of debate in the wee hours of the morning and stripped that language from the authorizing legislation. That's no way to run a government. And beyond those riders, there's thousands of programs that are being cut willy-nilly. One such program, for example, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They provided the early warning to people on the West Coast when they knew about the tsunami. And yet we are told by NOAA that the 30 percent cut in this bill, excuse me, 28 percent cut in this bill for NOAA would dismantle our early warning system to save a few million dollars. That's just wrong. You know, there was just an article that people are beginning to realize other things that are cut in this program to save a few dollars. Now, $285 million is not a few dollars, but consider what happens when you cut $285 million out of the program integrity section of the Internal Revenue Service. They collect $10 for every dollar we spent. And so you cut out $285 million and it costs you about $3 billion in revenue that should be collected. Gentleman's time I yielded to the gentleman an additional minute. Gentleman has yielded an additional minute. The only point that I started by suggesting, and it's, I'm sure it's not in contention, this is no way to run a government. We have a responsibility on the Appropriations Committee to fund these agencies, 
to determine our priorities, to reflect the interest and the will of the American people. This process does not do that. The bill, H.R. 1, does not do that. The American people deserve better. They de deserve careful deliberation. We need to cut, but we need to cut responsibly. This bill will pass, but this should be the last CR. Let's get a full year appropriations bill passed and as soon as possible. I, I'd be more than happy to yield. There is an article today in the Washington Post how House GOP spending cuts would add up to more spending later. I mean, this is what we worry about here. I, I yield an additional minute. And, uh, and one of the things that I'm most concerned about is the women and infant care program, WIC, where you provide nutrition to an expected mother who's probably on Medicaid and help her and the, the baby to be born uh, in a more healthy way. And we find out that the hospitals in this country provide $26 billion of health care for, the, for these same babies who were born premature. So it's, you know, pay me now or pay me later. And, 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 and in this case, it would be a lot more. The, the, the IRS is, is another example. NOAA weather satellites is another example. It's in the middle of this tsunami and earthquake. We need to be doing more in these areas. And the American people understand this. They, they want us to make reasonable judgments. And I hope we can uh, make reasonable judgments. I, I happen to be the ranking on defense. We can cut some money out of defense. We cut $15 billion. We can do a little bit more in that area. But I just, I just think we've got to be careful. And when, when this final package comes together, we've got to take out the ones that would be revenue raisers. I thank okay. the very distinguished Gentleman's gentleman. Time thank expired. you. And I thank the chairman. Gentleman from Kentucky. I yield myself one minute. The uh, gentleman from Virginia says that the public deserves that we pass appropriations bills. Uh, and I could not agree with him more. Uh, his majority last year failed to pass a single bill out of the 12 that we were supposed to pass. That's why we're here. We're trying to clean up the mess that the gentleman from Virginia's party left us when we took office in January. Uh, and so that's why we're here. Yes, it's a terrible way to do business, uh, and uh, uh, this should be the last CR extension that we pass before we have an agreement with the other body and the White House on the rest of this year. However, Mr. Speaker, again, the gentleman's party in the Senate refuses to pass a bill and lay something on the table. We are going to the conference table to negotiate, and we're sitting there by the, ourselves. The other body will not come forward with a proposition. Until that time, I don't know what we do. Now I yield uh, three minutes to the chairman of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Appropriation, gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Adderholt. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Rogers, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the bill before us today is another necessary step in addressing the national imperative of reducing our debt while also <laughs> keeping the government operating. Essential functions like Homeland Security are sustained under this bill and sustained in a fiscally responsible way. Within the more than $6 billion of spending reductions contained in this bill is a rescission of $107 million to Customs and Border Protection. A rescission of unobligated balances requested by the administration for FY11, supported by a minority, passed by this body as part of H.R. 1 and also included in the Senate Appropriations Committee recently reported bill. But this bill also sends a very clear, clear signal to the White House and to the Senate. As the, chair, as the Speaker and Chairman Rogers have clearly stated, no one wants the government shut down. The only people that are talking about a shutdown of the government are those who are avoiding the tough decisions and seeking to shift blame from their own failure to act. Instead of excuses, the American people want results. Less spending and a leaner, more effective government. And that's exactly what this temporary stopgap bill delivers. 
I couldn't agree more with what the chairman just stated uh, just a, a couple of minutes ago. Congress didn't, get the, Congress didn't get its work done, and the Senate has yet to provide a viable alternative to the House passed H.R. 1, a bill that stands as the only year-long spending measure for FY11 passed by either Congress of, uh, Chamber of Congress. So complaints about a short-term stopgap bill like this CR ring hollow when the House passed solutions has been on the negotiating table for a, almost a month. The President proposed spending level for FY11 is no longer a viable option, a fact acknowledged by not only the administration itself, but also by both parties in both chambers of Congress. So the time to get to work and fill our duty to the American people is long overdue. Congress needs to deliver what the American people have so resoundingly demanded. I can only hope the administration and the Senate will also acknowledge the reality of our nation's physical crisis, demonstrate the resolve to reduce spending significantly below the current FY10 level, and come to the table with a viable budget for the remainder of this year. The American people demand no less. I thank the gentleman, uh, the chairman uh, of the uh, Appropriations Committee for yielding, and I yield back the balance. I would be happy to yield to the chairman. It was stated a moment ago by a gentleman on the other side that this CR cuts NOAA uh, and the tsunami prediction monies. That is not so. The only thing in this bill that cuts money from NOAA are the earmarks. And yes, we cut the earmarks, but they had nothing to do with tsunami warning. Will the gentleman yield just briefly? Time has expired. Gentleman from Washington. I yield myself 15 seconds. I want to correct the record. I was referring to H.R. 1, not to this C.R. You're, the gentleman from Kentucky is absolutely correct. Well, the gentleman yield? Of course. H.R. Uh, 1 doesn't cut tsunami warning monies, nor well, weather service monies. There, there, there are some things in there that, that I think n n NOAA thinks would have an effect on their weather forecast. Well, NOAA's wrong. <laughs> okay, well, we'll Time check that out. Fired. The gentleman Luke. wish to recognize the gentleman from Washington. Do you wish to recognize somebody else? Amazing. Yes, I no no. Yeah. Yes, I want to yield uh, two minutes to the delegate from the District of Columbia, Eleanor Holmes Norton. The gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for two minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Look, the majority has chosen to run the government, the federal government, from CR to CR, but the majority has no right to inflict this operational outrage on the local funds of a local jurisdiction, the District of Columbia. Uh, it may want, the majority may want to, to uh, incur for the federal government the operational difficulties. And after all, the District of Columbia uh, delivers services to federal officials, including the president, federal buildings, foreign uh, embassies, and the like. But does the majority really want uh, to risk, to put the district and its operations at risk, or to place what Wall Street almost surely will do, a risk premium on the district due to the fact that we are being put from CR to CR. Uh, this is a fragile economy for every big city. The D.C.'s local budget was approved a year ago in the city and last summer by the Appropriations Committee, yet the District of Columbia is being held hostage to a federal fight, although the District of Columbia can do nothing to free itself from this federal fight. I have tried to get the district on successive CRs so that we could spend our own money all year. Uh, there is no disapproval of that here. I wager that very few members even know that the district would close down if the federal government closed down, would be perplexed by it, would have no objection to our spending our own local money all year long. We raise and manage $8 billion. We have a right to spend our local funds without being, being dragged into a federal fight. You can't run a big city from CR to CR. I ask you to find a way to f between now and three weeks to free D.C. to run its own city uh, for the rest of the, f of the federal year. Let my people General go. Gentlemen, time has expired. expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to a new member of our committee, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dent.
Speaker, I, I rise in support of H.J. Res. Uh, 48. As has been stated, this legislation cuts six billion dollars in funding. The responsible cuts. This is two billion dollars per week, and it should be noted too. There is broad bipartisan agreement to nearly all of the cuts contained in this legislation. Uh, basically, everything that's in this legislation was also contained in H.R. 1. We should also note too that if this legislation is enacted, this legislation would represent the largest spending cut on domestic discretionary programs in history when you combine this with what was cut two weeks ago, the four billion. Again, if enacted, this will represent the largest spending cut on domestic discretionary programs in American history should we enact this legislation. Now I know that some people around here think that this bill really doesn't go far enough, but it certainly does represent a very big step forward. You know, the cuts that are contained in here, we're, we're eliminating uh, 2.6 billion dollars in earmark funding from agriculture, uh, CJS, financial services, and interior. Uh, the cuts include uh, rescissions, reductions, and program terminations. And I, I think we all understand too that uh, that this, if we pass this, this will prevent a government shutdown. And uh, we need to prevent that while these negotiations can continue. We need to have that. We need to come to some type of agreement uh, for the balance of this fiscal year. But in the meantime, this represents responsible cuts, broad bipartisan agreement. I say let's cut some spending, and let's cut it now, and let's cut it today. Take yes for an answer. Don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, this is the right thing to do, and the American people will appreciate it. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back.